Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our New Testament survey class. I have one o'clock straight up, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I will move over to prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your message to us in the New Testament. And thank you especially for the story of your son Jesus when he was here on earth. Pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us in this time that as we look at the Synoptic Gospels, that you would open our eyes, let us see clearly the great truth of your Son Jesus having come and lived as one of us and died on our behalf. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I got a cup of coffee here, so I'm going to do this from time to time. It's a fresh pot. Mm. It's much better than yesterday. <laughs> so, okay. Today we are uh, actually, last week was. Uh, Introduction. Today we're actually going to jump into the study of the Synoptic Gospels, and I'll explain what that means if you don't know or don't remember um, in a minute. But first I said I was going to finish up a little bit of history stuff. This, of course, is the outline. It's a slightly different format than what, what's on the document that I gave you all, but this is, uh, today we're going to begin dealing with the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then next week we'll do deal with the Gospel of John and then the Book of Acts. But I want to start out by giving you um, a little bit more of the history. The intertestamental period is the period um, that, and this actually is slightly before the intertestamental period in terms of the dates I have up here. Intertestamental means between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The, um, in 586, 587, Jerusalem falls to the Babylonians and the Babylonian captivity begins. But it doesn't last very long, actually. It's only about uh, 50 years or so. And then the Persians defeat the Babylonians and allow the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem. Now, not all that many of them go. When you've lived someplace for 50 years, you know, a generation or two, then you don't... Um, a lot of people had settled. They had jobs. They had homes. They were not interested in going back. So there was not a huge influx of the Jews back into uh, Israel. And in fact, during the time they were there, because there were 50 years, one, one and a half or so generations, they had begun to speak the local language, uh, which is Aramaic or Chaldean, it's sometimes called, which is the language the Babylonians spoke. And that's why Aramaic is spoken, was spoken in the time of Jesus, because they had carried that with them from their Babylonian captivity when they came back. In 538 uh, to 438, that 100 year period, we get Zerubbabel and Ezra first coming back to rebuild the temple, and you get there several different returns. Then around 450 BC, which is in the middle of that, uh, you know, it's, it's inside that rebuilding of the temple period, is Malachi, who is the last Old Testament proper, uh, prophet. He's the last one we have in our book. He's the last one dated. Then 445 to 420, the problem had been that even though they were rebuilding the temple, they didn't have a wall around the city anymore, and people kept coming in and stealing stuff. It was insecure. They were being attacked. So the book of Nehemiah is all about, in, in, the, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah is one book. You know, so it covers a 100-year period or so. Um, Nehemiah goes back and rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. And so by 420, we have the wall is rebuilt, the temple is rebuilt, people have resettled there, not nearly all of them, but a lot of them, quite a few have. And that's kind of the setting we have where the next great event in history happens, and it's one of the great events in, in everybody's history in this part of the world. In 332 BC, Alexander the Great, uh, the son of Philip of Macedon, decides that he's going to follow up on his father's original plans, his father had been assassinated, to... Um, conquer the Persian Empire. The Persians and the Greeks, even though Philip was a Macedonian, he felt like a Greek, they spoke Greek, it actually was the Macedonian language as well, but they tended to speak Greek. He loved the Greek mythology, he thought of himself as Greek. I actually had some, you know, at least one, on one of the cruises when I said that technically Alexander wasn't Greek, he was Macedonian. There was some of the people listening to my lecture, when they got off the next stop, which was in Greece, and they were talking to a man there, he got pretty heated with the fact that he was saying that Alexander was not Greek, but he wasn't, he was Macedonian. It was, not, it was a different country at that time. Um, this is what Alexander the Great did. He started out in Macedonia, which is here, the northern area above what was Greece. He conquered all of this area. Um, he had become a general in his father's military when he was 18. A general, not just a soldier, a general. And so 
he crossed over all of this territory was, with the exception of Egypt, all of this was controlled by Persia. And he crosses over and fights one battle after another, as I, I think, I don't know if this is in this class, I said this before. Um, the first Persian army that he confronted was 100,000 men. He had 30,000 men, and he defeated them soundly. Later on, as he began conquering territory, he got a few recruits joined him, and he ended up having 38,000. But the second battle, the second major battle, Darius, the king of uh, Persia, decided that he was going to make absolutely sure he didn't lose again, and so he recruited, he got a 200,000 man army, which was soundly defeated by Alexander's 38,000 men. And this continues. These are the major battles in different places. Um, and Alexander came down through here. He defeated Tyre. Did I tell you guys any of those stories last week? Okay. Um, the city, there was a the part of the city of Tyre was on the coast, but the real citadel of Tyre, the main part of the city, was in on an island that was almost a kilometer offshore. And so these guys are in this fortress on this island. So I, when did I talk about this? I remember because we built it up. Yeah. It might have been old. Right? Oh, maybe. I remember it. Okay. It could have been the old city. So he tore down the old city. I'll do it fast then. He told, tore down the old city and used the ruins to build a causeway almost a kilometer long and 300 yards wide out to Tyre, uh, to the fortress part of Tyre. And he figured, okay, I also need a navy in order to do this right. So he went and got a navy. Because <laughs> he, he now controlled all the Persian port ports along all of this part of the coastline. So he just went to the Persian ports, and when the Persian boats pulled in, he said, by the way, you belong to me now. He defeated Tyre, um, killed th tens of thousands of people, sold 30,000 people off into slavery. Um, he could actually be kind of you know, nice about it if you, if you surrender. And if you didn't, he was pretty ruthless. We, when he came down to Jerusalem, they met him out, outside the city and said, you know, look at our holy book. It talks about, uh, you know, the, the ruler from the west coming and defeating the Persians. And Alexander said, cool, that's me. Um, and I like your book. And you guys, I'm not going to bother you. You go, you go back to your city. And so he left them alone. Um, comes down, takes over Egypt. They welcome him as a, as a conqueror and as a god. He didn't have to even fight to take Egypt. And then after a while there, where he is proclaimed by an oracle out in the desert in Egypt to be a god, the son of Zeus. He then goes up, crosses over, fights more battles, takes over Babylon, all of Persia, Parthia, Bactria, all the way over into India. And he wants to go all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And his soldiers, you know, as I always say, he said, Al, 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 we got to go home. Come on, it's been nine years, almost ten years. So they ended up coming back this way, and when they came back, he was going to make Babylon the capital of his new empire. He dies at age 33, 32, 33, from what cause we don't know. And he did not leave any heirs. So there was no one to inherit this. Um, so, after he defeats Persia and much more, he dies and the War of the Diadochi, it's called in, in Greek, the War of the Successors. His various generals went to war to try to control the empire. Um, and Ptolemy I conquered Egypt uh, first, and then later on he came back up and took over the Middle East as well. This is sort of what the map looked like. After all of this battle, there were only four generals that really ended up in, in Seleucus, was one of the lesser generals, but he ended up one of the most powerful after it was all over. Um, Cassander and Lysimachus had Greece in Thrace and a little bit of Asia Minor. Ptolemy had all of Egypt, and, and these are the generals' names. And then he controlled the Middle East as well. In other words, it came up pretty much here, like Egypt and Israel. And then Seleucus controlled most of Asia Minor and this in Persia, well, what had been Persia. Well, that was all well and good, except they still were fighting each other. And so, in 320 um, was when Ptolemy conquered Jerusalem. That's how it ended up being under his control. And for a long, long time, this was really good for the Jews, because Ptolemy allowed them pretty much complete freedom. They could continue to practice their religion. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, was in charge. All of that was great, until... 198. In 198, the Seleucids, obviously we're, you know, we're going down the road now, we're 130 years later almost, uh, they end up 
throwing Ta the Ptolemaic people out of Israel and they take over control in 198. Then in 190, eight years later, the Romans are starting to come, you know, the traveling by land coming across and fighting battles. They have not yet established themselves at this point as being the dominant power in the world. But in 190 BC, there was a major battle in Magnesia, which is in Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey. And the Romans defeat the Seleucid army. And they not only defeated the Seleucid army, the Romans lost 400 men in that battle, the Battle of Magnesia. The Seleucids lost 53,000, almost 54,000. So the, the winner was pretty obvious. So the Seleucids retreat. All of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, is taken by the Romans. Um, and then in 175, the Seleucids still control all of this area and, and the, the Holy Land, if you will. The Romans are all up in here now, Ptolemy's down in Egypt. Well, in 175, a new ruler takes over the Seleucids, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Epiphany means a vision from God. They thought well of themselves back in those days. So that's in 175. Then, because they'd already defeated the Ptolemies and thrown them out of Israel, uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes decided he's going to go down and, ha and, and scout out Egypt and the Ptolemies for the purpose of launching a, an attack and taking over Egypt, which was kind of a crown jewel, the oldest civilization, etc. Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. She was descended from this Greek general, okay? because they intermarried and all that kind of stuff. Well, in 168, Antiochus goes down to Egypt to consider attacking them, and there he meets an old friend of his who was Roman, that he had known for years, and he thinks this guy will side with me. And the guy who's a representative from Rome, visiting the Ptolemaic, uh, you know, all the stuff about Cleopatra and Mark Antony and, you know, uh, all of that <coughs> mess. You, you saw the movie. Uh, and, uh, so there were Romans around a lot then. Later on, they controlled all of it. Um, and this guy says to uh, Antiochus IV, you need to tell me right now what your intention is with regard to Egypt, because the Romans, they're friends of ours. And um, Antiochus says, well, you know, I'm going to do it. And the, the story is that the guy took his sword out and he drew a circle around um, Ant Antiochus IV and said, before you step out of this circle, you better tell me your intentions, because one way or the other, I'm reporting back to Rome. And they'd already had their behinds royally kicked by the Roman army, and he wasn't willing to, to confront that. Well, the problem was, after he got chased out of <coughs> Egypt and knew he wasn't going to be able to deal, do, do anything, because he'd be fighting the Romans, which didn't go very well, he goes back, to, um, back up to Syria, which was their home, was in Syria, but then also to Israel. And he says, uh, he decides, you know, you know, somebody gets beat up uh, in the schoolyard, they go home and kick the cat, right? So he decided to kick the cat, the cat being the Jewish people in Israel. And he comes home and he uh, sets up these horrendous new rules against the Jews. He says they uh, could not assemble for prayer. The observance of the Shabbat, Sabbath, was forbidden. Uh, possession of the Hebrew scriptures were uh, illegal. Circumcision was illegal and women were being executed for having their children circumcised. Oh, okay. Um, dietary laws were illegal, and they set up pagan idols, especially an idol to Zeus, in the temple in Jerusalem, and they were sacrificing pigs on, you know, in the temple. You know how that must have gone over. Um, so, we get the Seleucid dynasty in Antioch and Syria, defeat the Ptolemies, then they try to force all of these new rules on the Jews, and the Jews, led by a pious Jewish priest named Mattathias and his sons, revolt. They come into his village and try to insist that they set up an altar to, to a pagan god and sacrifice a pig on it. Mattathias refuses. Another Jew says, well, I'll do it then. And Mattathias kills that guy. And then they kill the, the Seleucid guards that are with him. And they run off into the hills and start a rebel war, which is called the, uh, the Maccabean Revolt. The reason it's called the Maccabean Revolt is that one of Mattathias' sons was named Judas, and he became known as, he was a very successful general in this rebel war, and he became known as Judas Maccabeus, which means Judas the Hammer. So it became called the Maccabean Rebellion. After three years of war, the Jews returned 
they take Jerusalem, they retake the temple, and they go through the cleansing of the temple. That's where we get the celebration of Hanukkah. And it happens, you know, at the end, end of our year, and so it's usually right around Christmas. This year, actually, Hanukkah starts um, at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve, and it goes till 6 p.m. Uh, New Year's Eve. You know, it's an eight-day period, or New Year's, uh, eight-day period. So, because it took them eight days to get new oil and cleanse the temple and all that. The Hasmoneans, um, they drive the Seleucids back, they um, take control of that area, and they set up one of the very few, other than David and Solomon, one of the very few monarchies they ever had, which was the, the Hasmonean monarchy, named, that's their family name. Then, because they're still getting trouble from the Seleucids, they make the mistake of appealing to Rome, knowing that the, the Seleucids are scared of Rome, and they say, help us! Well, Pompey, the great general, who's the one who had conquered, he later on became emperor, who had conquered all of you know, Eastern Europe and, and Asia Minor, he says, sure. So, in 63 BC, he comes down and he conquers Jerusalem. He doesn't just help them get rid of the Seleucids. They do get rid of the Seleucids. The Seleucids are, you know, they, they were no more after this time. But they conquer the whole area, and then in 40 BC, this is, again, roughly 40 years before Christ, the Romans appoint Herod, who had been trained in Rome and was friendly with a lot of the, the Roman uh, imperial family. They appoint him the king of Judea. He's not Jewish. He's not Roman. He's not Jewish. He was Idumean, which is an area south of um, the Holy Land. So he was a foreigner, but they, they may put him in charge, okay? Questions about that? Uh, so, I have one question. When Alexander the Great was conquering against these greater armies, and I think you said something about somebody else doing the same thing, was it because of technology tactics? Was it because of advances in warfare that like, he had that others didn't? Or well, how did 30,000 defeat 100,000? Yeah, it's, part of it is, is his father, uh, Philip, which I've said before is the most underrated person in history probably, because he designed a completely new method of warfare. Okay, yes. He created these, um, instead of just lining up and charging against the other guys, he created phalanxes that could attack in formation. Mm -hmm. He created a thing called a sarissa, which is a 16 foot long spear. Now previously, when somebody attacked, if there was more than one row of people, the only people who could actually fight were the ones in the front. And it wasn't until they got killed or got out of the way that the next row could. Well, these 16 foot long sarissas, when they lined up in these blocks of men, the first four or five rows could extend their spear out between the other guys. And then you had more rows behind that would hold their spear, their sarissa up, until they got to the front. And he also invented heavy, heavy cal cavalry. Some people have said, although I, don't, I think historically this is probably not true, some people have proposed that he may have invented the stirrup, which was absolutely necessary to make, think about riding a horse into battle without stirrups. Um, you don't have any stability. And so there were all these tactics and techniques that Philip had come up with that while when he was a general in his father's army, um, Alexander perfected. And so part of it, and part of the reason that he won all these battles with a smaller army is because he was Alexander. He did crazy things. He did things nobody would have expected. I mean, when he gets over into India, there's the, against King Porus, there's one thing where he, one battle where he's on one side of the river, they're in formation, the enemy's on formation on the other side of the river, it's uphill, across water, and as I recall it was raining. And so all the advantages, every advantage was to the forces of Porus, this was the king of, uh, one of the Rajas of India. Um, so what does uh, Alexander do? He attacks across the river uphill against a larger force that had war elephants. Um, he also sent troops around in a flanking maneuver to cross the river, you know, in other places and come in behind. But it, half the time it was just, he, he just freaked them out. You know, they, they'd never seen anything like this or anybody like this. There's a great, there was a mosaic that was uncovered in Pompeii, I should have brought a picture of it, that is a picture of, it's a mosaic that's been, it was, part of it was gone, but they've, they've sort of reconstructed it. It's Alexander aboard his horse Bucephalus, you know, with his sword, and he's attacking in this direction, and you've got Darius in his war chariot. Darius was the king of Persia. And Darius 
is also going that way. You know, he's running because the first couple of times Darius was there, and one of the reasons that, that Alexander won is because um, when Darius started losing, I mean, he just he had such a big army, he assumed it was a done deal, and when it wasn't, he ran off, which demoralized his troops. So that was one of the things that happened. Um, he, I could tell you lots of stories. I've lectured on Alexander the Great before, but anyway, Terry. So yeah, it was a combination like, from the sound of it. Uh, Good strategy and, and the first introduction of weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, so, and the personality. I mean, you know, there are great generals and there are okay generals, and he was perhaps the greatest general ever. They still study his military tactics in, in West Point and other military schools. Um, you know, and that was 2,300 years ago. Um, what did you say the odds were again? 400 or 500 died? In no, that was the Romans. That was the Romans against the Seleucids. Oh. 400 Romans were killed in the Battle of Magnesia, and I think it was 54,000, almost 54,000 Seleucids. It's even makes sense. It's hard to fathom. Yeah. That. Well, it's even the numbers, I mean, in those days, the populations weren't what they are today. Well, the, Pers <coughs> the Persian Empire, um, I mean, the Seleucids, the, they drew people from everywhere they controlled, and the Persians drew people from everywhere they controlled. They put together an army of 200,000, it's because, you know, they had millions of square miles of territory, and everybody there technically could, could be drafted into their military. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite extraordinary things. But Alexander, there's never been anybody quite like him. There's probably no other general. He never lost a battle, and he died when he was 32, 33 after conquering almost all the known world. I mean, he was still young enough that they say when his generals finally said, no, Al, we're not going to go on to the Pacific Ocean. We, you know, the Great Waters, as they called it. We want to go home. They say he went in his tent and pouted for, pouted for a couple of days. Um, so it was... It, there were little things. Things. No. <laughs> That's And they, they loved him. I mean, they trusted him, obviously. Uh, but they, they just didn't have enough. And there are, there are great stories about, about him. Anyway. Um, so, we have the Babylonian exile, this is just an overview of these periods. Then the Persian period, after, after the Persians, under Cyrus the Great, defeat the Babylonians. Then the last prophet, 430 to 450 uh, BC. The Hellenistic or Greek period, uh, Helena, Hellenistic, and you hear that reference, uh, I'm going to talk about it in a minute, with regard to Hellenized Jews. The Greek name for Greece is Hellas. So Hellenized means influenced by Greece, by the Greek culture, okay? So the Hellenistic or Greek period was the period in which Alexander was conquering. You'll notice that that's a 10-year period there. That's the Greek name for? For the, 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 the country of Greece, Hellas. In fact, if you look at a map in Greece, it will still say Hellas, H-E-L-L-A-S. Uh, then the Ptolemaic period, I mentioned, this was when the Ptolemies were controlling the Middle East. The Seleucid period, when they defeated the Ptolemies and threw them out of the Middle East. Then we get to, with all the oppression, we get to the Maccabean period. This is the war that occurred in there. Then the, the rulers from that family who took over the area became uh, the Hasmonean ruling period. Then the Roman period, when 63, when uh, Ptolemy, um, they're not Ptolemy, when... Um, Not Harry, the, the general that became an emperor, just completely <laughs> lost it. Uh, Pompey. Uh, how many times have I talked about this? Pompey uh, comes in, conquers all of that, and then in 39 BC, the Romans appoint Herod, and he rules for um, you know, 35 years, up until 4 BC. Okay? So you've got that background history now. I want to talk about one other thing, and that is the Apocrypha. This is more an Old Testament thing. In fact, those of you in the Old Testament class, you're going to hear about this when we get to the end because it's intertestamental. Apocrypha um, has various literal meanings. It includes hidden, esoteric, spurious, questionable. Um, it basically means, uh, it, Apocrypha usually is, is interpreted as meaning hidden writings. These are the non-canonical texts, meaning non-canonical means they are not part of canon, they are not considered being spoken by God through his servants, at least not by Protestants, and not, not by the Catholics either until the 1500s when they, in, in sort of 
an act of spite against the Protestant reformers. They said, no, this is now part of scripture. This is now canon. The, um, so these books that are in between the Old Testament and New Testament, they were written after Malachi, before the first letters of Paul, before Jesus, actually. Uh, they include 1st Esdras, Esdras, Esdras and 2nd Esdras, which is a different way of spelling Ezra, but it's uh, not the same book as Ezra. And the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate, they've given the names 3rd and 4th Esdras because of the fact there is an Ezra. Um, Tovic, Judith, in addition to Esther in the Vulgate, it's identified as Esther 10, 4 through 1624. The Book of Wisdom, the Book of Ecclesiasticus, that is not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, sometimes called Sirach, or the wisdom of Sirach. The book of, Wis uh, the, uh, book of Baruch, the epistle of Jeremy, or Jeremiah, the song of three children, the song of Susanna, Bell and the dragon, I misspelled that, sorry, I didn't type this in because it was funny, it's just dragon, it's not a dragon. Um, the prayer of Manassas and First and Second Maccabees. Part of these are historical books that deal with the intertestamental period and the battle of the, the Maccabean revolt and the battle against the Seleucids. Some of them are uh, additions, you know, there's a, the, the addition to, to Daniel, to Esther, um, to the Old Testament. The Jewish people have never accepted this. In fact, they officially said this is not part of canon in the Council of Jamnia in the, like the 3rd century AD. And when the Protestant reformers come along, they looked at these and said, it's not quoted anywhere by Jesus. There's one reference, one, one reference to a passage that's in um, Jude, I think it is. But otherwise, it's not quoted, it's not referred to, the Jews don't accept it, so the Protestant reformers said no. It is considered different, different of these books. Six of these books are included in the Catholic Bible. Nine of them, I think, are included in the Orthodox Bible. All right? If you ever pick up a Jerusalem Bible or a Catholic Bible, Jerusalem Bible is an ecumenical Bible, and you look in between the Old and New Testament, you will find some of these books. That's what, if any of you came out of Catholicism, you'll recognize some what? of those. What are they? Is, is it just basic, basically like the same ideas that are in our Bibles, or does it actually have some totally different context? Well, some of it has completely okay. different content, and the reason why it's never been accepted as Scripture is that it's not consistent completely. And some of the doctrines, you wonder where they came from, like the doctrine of purgatory. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are some doctrines that come out of here that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church in some cases accept that we don't, because this is the source for them. Um, it's also true that, that both because there are doctrinally kind of different things that are not consistent with the New Testament or Old Testament. And there's also some stuff that's just unbelievable. Bell and the dragon really does have a dragon in it. Okay? Um, so there, there are sort of flights, flights of fancy in here as well. That's why up until the 1500s, uh, even the Catholic Church didn't accept this as canon. And they did so primarily in order to just poke the Protestant reformers in the eye and say, if you say this is not part of canon, we're going to make it part of canon. Even though before it was called deuterocanonical, meaning of second, second level, not equal to the rest of Scripture. But now the Catholic Church says it is. Okay? Yes? This is kind of off the subject, but I was just wondering, um, do they actually have in their Bible anything that says that they, that they should... Uh, worship the, the Virgin Mary or worship no. the saints or anything. I don't. I mean, I'm just wondering. I yeah. Well, the, the reason for some of some of those doctrines, I mentioned the Apocrypha is the source of some things like purgatory. Uh, there are other doctrines. The, the for the Protestant Church, the source of authority is Scripture. Sola Scriptura, which means Scripture alone, is one of the great cries of the Reformation. You know, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Scriptura. You know, uh, grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. The Catholic Church has two sources of authority which they consider equal. One is scripture and the other is the magisterium, that is the leaders of the church since the beginning. Mm -hmm. This is why the Pope has given so much authority. And so at various times when popes, especially if they were speaking ex cathedra, which does not very often, ex cathedra means from the chair, you know, from, in, in, in other words, speaking officially as the head of the church, and they declared that to be infallible when, he, when they declare that. When the Pope says something like that, that Mary is ever virgin, the idea that the Immaculate Conception, that Mary was born without sin, not just Jesus, mm -hmm. things like that, because the, the leaders of the Catholic Church declare that to be true, that's equal to Scripture. And so they consider it of equal value. 
But it's actually not in their it's not scripture. In the Bible. Nope. It's not in their Bible. Nope, but they consider it just as valid if somebody, if a, if a pope or the, the leaders of the Catholic Church have accepted it as true. Okay. Okay? Right. One more thing I want to do before we actually jump into the Synoptic Gospels is to talk about the religious sects that existed in the first century. You need to understand this so that when you're reading the, the Gospels and Acts, things make more sense. There were two major or primary sects in the Jewish faith in New Testament times. The first were the Pharisees, which were Hebraic separatists. They, remember I just told you, the, the Hellenized, the influence of Alexander. Everybody spoke Greek. They went to Greek theater. They practiced Greek sporting events. So much of that was contrary to what the Jews historically had believed. Many of the Jews uh, were speaking Greek to the exclusion of Hebrew. They forgot how to read Hebrew, which is why in the third century, uh, 70 Jewish scholars went to Alexandria in Egypt and translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. That's the Septuagint. The reason they had to do that is because a lot of these people, had, uh, the Jews, had forgotten how to read Hebrew. And to have access to their own scriptures, they had to translate it into Greek. Well, the Pharisees were against that whole Greek influence thing. So they were he uh, Hebraic separatists. They wanted to get rid of the influence that had come following uh, Alexander. The Sadducees, who you also hear about in the New Testament, they were big on the culture of the, of the Greeks. They liked the Greek language. They liked the Greek influence. And so these two were always fighting each other. And I'm going to give you some examples of the differences in a second. But these are the two big ones that are mentioned in Scripture. But there are two other lesser, less important, but still present um, sects. And those were the Essenes and the Zealots. The Essenes were sort of an apocalyptic um, communal group. They're the ones that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. They lived in community. They, um, they were celibate. They had a teacher of righteousness, which some liberal scholars need to have their head checked. Uh, believe might have been what Jesus was. There's no evidence for that. They just made that up. Um, it's true. Um, and yet you'll get Elaine Pagels and others who will claim that Jesus was the teacher of righteousness. We have no indication he was ever involved in the Essene sect. But they, uh, they were a kind of unique, um, cult-like cult almost, uh, version of Judaism. And then the Zealots. The Zealots were conservative Jewish people, usually. But they were militant nationalists, zealot because they were zealous to reestablish the greatness of, of Israel and the Jewish faith and to drive off the Romans. Um, one of the apostles is called Simon the Zealot. He was a member of the Zealot party. They typically were wanted by the law because they were against the Roman Empire. Um, and they practiced uh, guerrilla tactics against the Romans. And they assassinated people. In fact, Judas Iscariot, uh, typically they have interpreted that as meaning Judas from Cariot, which was a town. But Iscari means a dagger man, an assassin. So some people, some scholars have proposed that it may actually be that it's not the town he's from, but it's a description of the fact that he too was a zealot and that he, Judas, had been involved in um, you know, as one of their hitmen, that's what that means. The Iscati were hitmen for the Zealots. Um, so, yes? Well, uh, was Barnabas when they, was his name Barnabas when they let go? Oh, Barabbas. Barabbas. Was Barabbas. He I, I don't think it identifies him as a Zealot. He was, um, he was a rebel. So he may have been, he may have been part of the, the party of Zealots. It actually, I mean, it was a group, a party, and people joined it. Oh. Uh, so whether he was, a lot of Jews who were, maybe were part of the Zealot party didn't like the Romans and wanted to get rid of them. So Barabbas, I'm not sure if he was or not. Um, yes? Did the Pharisees hang out with the Zealots? They have a lot of commonality? Probably a high percentage of the Zealots would have come from the, from the Pharisaic party, from the Pharisaic side of things. You know, the, one of them defines more a theological orientation, Phariseeism. The other defines a political orientation. Now again, in those days, there was no separation. There was no separation of church and state. The, the, the religion ruled the political as well, and so there weren't strong divides. But by being a Pharisee, one was raised in that tradition as Paul was. You know, Paul, Paul proudly says he's a Pharisee. Um, and they were the ones that were serious about scripture. They were the ones that were serious about following stuff. In fact, 
Um, this gives you, let me just stick all this up here, and you can see. Um, the Sadducees, which, uh, Pharisees rather, which literally means the separated ones. And then Sadducees means the righteous ones. The Pharisees held to the authority of the entire Old Testament, as well as the oral law. What we know of as the Talmud, which was not written down until much later, when they were fearful that they might forget it, because it had been passed down by memorization. Whereas the Sadducees viewed the Torah only, the first five books, as being of greater authority and tended to sort of disregard the rest of the, the Tanakh. So just the first five books. The Pharisees believed in miracles, angels, and immortality of the soul. The Sadducees rejected miracles, angels, and immortality. Now the reason this is important, when you get to the book of Acts, and Paul has been, has been grabbed and beaten up and has to be rescued by the Roman soldiers, uh, and then when they bring him back to, in front of the Sanhedrin to be, to be you know, tried or interviewed, I don't think it's a trial, it's not supposed to be a trial, uh, the, the Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, right? They were members of both. The first thing out of Paul's mouth, you remember what it was when he gets come before the Sanhedrin? He says, I am here before you today because I preach the resurrection. The Pharisees go, we like this guy. <laughs> And the Sadducees say, get rid of him. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees start fighting each other, start arguing with each other so vehemently, the Romans have to take Paul out and take him back to the Antonia Fortress, which was connected to, to the temple grounds. And you don't understand what's going on there unless you understand that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were constantly fighting each other. And one of the things was that the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. Also, but when the person comes up to Jesus and says, okay, a man is married uh, to a woman and he dies and she marries his brother according to the law and he dies and they, bless you, bless you. Uh, and, you know, and so he ends, she ends up marrying seven brothers. And the Sadducees going, so who's, he, who's she married to in the resurrection? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason that that was a parody of a question is because the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. And that was their sort of way of poking fun at it. And Jesus' response is, you don't know anything, do you? <laughs> you don't know the law or anything else. In heaven there will be neither marriage nor giving in marriage. Okay. But that, you want to have to understand some of those differences in order to really understand what's going on in some of those passages. Um, so belief in the resurrection denied any life after death of Sadducees. The Pharisees were popular in the synagogues, but the Sadducees ruled in the temple. The high priest was almost always a Sadducee. They had the dominant power in the Sanhedrin, although, you know, they control the Sanhedrin, although there were Pharisees who were members. Okay? Make sense? All this is background. Did they both, each one, hold themselves above the other? Oh, they all, they thought they were right and the other guy was, the other side was completely wrong. And you're a bunch of morons, but we, we exactly. got it. Exactly. And the, when you hear um, scribes, usually the scribes would be people who, because they were officials of the temple, they would have worked for the Sadducees. Uh -huh. So sometimes when you read scribe, you know, uh, they're talking about the Sadducees there usually, right? Okay. The New Testament. Four sections of the New Testament we talked about last week. The Gospels, the Acts, the Book of Acts, the Epistles, and Revelation. Um, the Gospels and Acts are the history of Jesus and the early church. The Epistles are the letters that were written to sort of explain the faith. And they were the Epistles of Paul and the General Epistles, those written not by Paul. And interestingly, um, the letters that Paul wrote were usually named after who he was writing them to. Romans, Ephesians, Timothy, Titus. Whereas the general epistles are usually named for who wrote them. Okay? Hebrews being the exception to that. But uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, uh, Jude, 1st and 2nd Timothy, um, uh, not 1st, 2nd, uh, 1st, 2nd Peter. So, and then there is the book of Revelation, which stands by itself, because it is a book of visions of the future, apocalyptic literature. And by the way, apocalypse does not mean everything blows up. Apocalypse, well, it's come to mean that in our culture, you know, an apocalyptic tale means when everything goes wrong. Apocalypsis in Greek literally means revelation. It means the revealing of something that was previously hidden. So this is the apocalypse of John. Um, and it doesn't mean everything goes, goes wrong. It means the revelation of John. The Gospel and Acts, from the time that these things were written, the Gospel and Acts were looking back at the history that had already occurred previously. 
The epistles are referring to present things, writing to people who are alive right now, telling them how to understand the, the message of Jesus. And then the book of Revelation was talking about the future, how things will happen. So past, present, future. Okay. Um, questions about any of that? We're just going to jump into the actual Gospels now. But I, I honestly think that we make a mistake when we don't think about the background stuff. You know, like the history, the political environment, all of those things affect our understanding of it. All right, there are, as you know, I'm sure, four Gospels, and they each have kind of a different orientation. You know, why, why do we need four Gospels? Well, there's two major, uh, major divisions. One is that between the Synoptic Gospels, the first three, and the Gospel of John, but I'm going to get into that. But they all have sort of a different angle, a different focus. Matthew, who is the most, that's the most Jewish of all the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, for instance, talks about Jewish festivals and things like that and does not bother to explain them because he knows his readers who are Jewish are going to understand. It presents Jesus as the king of Israel in the context of how the Jews would have been, what they were looking for. That he is the Christ. Christ means anointed one. Christ is the Greek word that is the same as Messiah, which is the Hebrew word, both of them mean the anointed one, which is a shorthand for the king. So Christ, Messiah, anointed one, all mean the same thing. The son of David, the Messiah that is greater than Moses. So he's speaking to Jews for whom Moses was the lawgiver. He was, he was the dude up until that time. And Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah who is even greater than Moses. Okay? Mark, the shortest of the Gospels, and probably the first one, presents Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord. Um, Mark is more oriented toward Gentiles than Matthew is, and in both Mark and Luke, whenever they talk about a, Jew, a specifically Jewish thing, a festival, a whatever, they'll explain it, because they know at least some of their readers are going to be Gentiles, and they're not going to understand that, whereas Matthew never explains any of that. Then you have Luke, the longest of the Gospels, and the Luke and Acts, by the same writer, Luke, are the only books in all the Bible, Old and New Testament, that were written by non -Jew, a non-Jew. Luke was a Gentile. He was a physician, a friend of Paul's, a traveler with Paul. When Paul was arrested, I just mentioned, you know, the thing about the, the Romans had to take him out from the Sanhedrin before he got, you know, before they killed him. They kept him for a while. He said uh, they took him up to Caesarea, where he was in, He spent two years, um, probably because the governor at that time was waiting for him to offer him a bribe, and Paul wouldn't do it. And then he declares as a Roman citizen, he has a right to go to Rome. So they take him to Rome. Right? Well, it's during the two years that Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea, which is northern in Israel on the coast. That's during the time that Luke, who was one of his followers, who couldn't, you know, couldn't be with him then. Luke talks to everybody. He talks to Mary, he talks to the other apostles, uh, all of whom are still alive at this point, uh, with the exception of James, the first, the first um, apostle to die. And he interviews them about their experiences, especially those who had been with Jesus, who had known him, you know, all those years. And we'll see the passage in a minute uh, that Luke describes the fact that he's putting together an orderly account after having interviewed all these people. But he is a Gentile reporting on the experience of the Jews who had known Jesus. And he talks about Jesus as the Son of Man who provides salvation for all humanity. You notice the, the, the openness as a Gentile writer. Uh, it is the longest and most complete biography. Most of the times if, if you have, like in a Charlie Brown Christmas when they read the Christmas story, it's always out of Luke because it's the most complete one. Mark doesn't even have a Christmas story. Uh, but Luke is the most complete version. And then John presents Jesus as the divine, eternal Son of God who came to earth in, in human form. It's the most theological and the most symbolic of the Gospels. Okay? I'll explain that. Questions? You know you can ask questions. Unless you're just bored. Are these English names, like, would they actually have pronounced it Matthew and Mark? No, they're actually so Hebrew they're names that we've adopted. Luke is not. Luke is a Greek name. But how would they have spoken that name, Luke? Just as we are doing today. Well, yeah, Luke was Greek, but it would have been pronounced the same way, yeah. Okay. Matthew, Matthew is a Jewish name. It's a Jewish word. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. As is Mark, you know, John Mark. So many of the names that we've adopted are biblical names, but they were originally in Hebrew. But John, for, like we have Johan, 
right? Similar to John. Was right. Bill Ham or John? Well, there are there are versions of it. For instance, Jesus is the is the Hellenized version of Jesus' name. In Hebrew, it's Yeshua. And you in the Old Testament, we translate Yeshua Joshua. So the name Jesus and the name Joshua are exactly the same. But as far as I know, Matthew, Mark, and John, I mean they're so so short, there's not other pronunciations of them that I know of. Uh, well, Mateo, um, you know, that's the, that's the group, the uh, Spanish version of it. So there may have been, a, it may have been Mateo at one point. Oh, so well, I may be talking about that. I've wondered that, whether the, yeah. the names were similar. But... Well, there have been versions, you know, the changes of them. Some of them were probably the same and some of them were different, like Yeshua and Jesus, you know. And, and, and some of it is because we translate it into Greek when it comes into the New Testament. Okay. But, um, so... Another thing, which I'm sure you've, if you've ever traveled, if you've ever been to cathedrals, you've seen this, but you probably haven't noticed it, um, is that each of the four evangelists, the four evangelists are primary pillars of the history of the church. In fact, if you ever go, have any of you all been to Barcelona, to the Sagrada Familia? There are five towers, and they represent Mary and the four evangelists. Okay, what's that? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are in, held in high, such high regard in order for people, people to be able to recognize them whenever they're represented in art or in sculpture or in whatever, they each were given a symbolic form. Matthew is always represented in the form of a man, like the upper left. This is from the Book of Kells, which is an ancient illustrated Bible from Ireland. So, and you can see the Book of Kells if you go to University of Dublin uh, to museum. So you've got Matthew is the man, Mark on the right is represented as a lion, on the lower left, uh, John is represented as an, uh, I'm sorry, lower right is an eagle, um, Luke is the eagle, and uh, John is the ox, doesn't look particularly like an ox. But man, lion, eagle, and ox, it's based upon visions in Revelation and in Ezekiel, of these four images, which were understood in even Ezekiel, the Old Testament, as being prophetic statements about the four evangelists that would come. Okay? Um, is that generally accepted? I mean, I've never heard of any of this. Is that generally accepted that in, in Ezekiel that was... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was representation. Now, I say you've probably seen this. If you've ever seen anything like this, you'll... Next time you're in a cathedral, especially a, an old cathedral, if you're in Europe or someplace, and look around and see if you see a man, a lion, an eagle, and an ox. Those are representative of the four evangelists who are critical to the history and understanding of the church. So you will see that a lot if you know to look for it. Okay? Because if they just had four other guys up there, they could be anybody. By, by doing it this way, they're clearly communicating that this is who we're talking about. Right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. What are the and the 12 apostles? Is it the 12 apostles on your knees? Um, probably. Yeah, sure it is. And then that's Jesus, of course, sitting on the throne. I'm Our first going to ask why they're considered four evangelists and not four apostles. They weren't all apostles. Well, Mark wasn't an apostle, and Luke wasn't an apostle. Matthew and John were apostles, but uh, Mark is actually telling the story as he would have learned it from Peter, because he became the secretary and assistant to Peter for many years, and so Mark is pretty much the gospel according to Peter. Luke interviewed everybody. He was obviously approved of and an assistant to uh, Paul, but then he interviewed all the people when Paul was in prison for two years, and that's how we get the story. But so you, everybody who wrote New Testament books is either an apostle or they're someone who is approved by the apostles. Um, the only exception to that that we don't know exactly is the book of Hebrew. Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. It's the only book that we don't have any indication of the author. Um, and yet, it's very consistent with all of the rest of the theology of Paul and everything else. And I've said before, I think that may be, and my old pastor Earl Palmer thought this too. I didn't know this when I first said it. Carolyn's mother, who she calls, you know, her mother the theologian, um, thought so too, that, that, that Hebrews might have been written by Priscilla. 
And the reason that we don't know who it was, but they accepted it, is because the content is so clearly canonical, but they couldn't quite get to the point of acknowledging that a, a book given by God was given through a woman. And so that's, otherwise, why else do we not have any idea who it was that wrote it, and yet we accept it? Because that was one of the rules for, for the, the, the rules for getting something into canon was one, it had to be written by an apostle or somebody approved by an apostle. Second, we had to know who it was. And then it had to be accepted by the majority of the church. And the fourth point was that it had to be consistent with the rest of what we believe God had communicated. Those were the rules. Hebrews fits all of those rules except we don't know who wrote it and we don't know, therefore, who would have approved them. But Paul approved of Priscilla. Um, and Priscilla and Aquila. In fact, it's the first time they're referred to it's Aquila and Priscilla. And they, they were great teachers because they taught Apollo, who became a major force in the church later in uh, Corinth. And after the first mention or so, they turn it around and it becomes Priscilla and Aquila. So she obviously was a major force because to mention the wife before the husband, or to mention the wife at all, for that matter, in those days, it was very significant. Okay? I'll go off on tangents here. Yes? Can you explain, explain the definition of an evangelist, an apostle, and a disciple? Right. Uh, evangelists were the, the in, in this context, were those who wrote the gospel stories. Okay. They were evangelists in that they gave us the story of Jesus, upon which, you know, I've had people say before that the scripture is God's revelation to us, and they go, well, Jesus was God's revelation to us. And I said, well, Jesus is God's revelation to the world, but how do we know about Jesus? In scripture, all right? So the evangelists are the ones who give us our understanding of Jesus that leads us to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why they're called evangelists. An evangelist is, is, in another sense, is anyone who calls other people to a saving knowledge of Christ. But the four evangelists are these guys because they laid out all of the basic understanding. An apostle, a dif difference in an apostle and a disciple, a disciple is one who follows and learns. An apostle is one who is sent. So the 12 apostles were the ones that Jesus called and prepared to send out to plant the church. Okay, so that's the difference of disciple and apostle. And evangelist, and, and the apostles clearly were evangelists, many of the disciples became evangelists, but when we talk about the four evangelists, it's these four guys. Okay? Good? Okay. Did any of the disciples become apostles after Pentecost? Well, they... Um, yeah, they started, I mean, all of the apostles, when Jesus first called them, they were all followers and learners at first. But he especially pulled those 12 aside, he would take them with him. And in fact, there were, there were three that, within that group that were especially close to him. You know, Peter, James, and John. They, was a, they were the three that he took up with him to the Mount of Transfiguration, that he took with him into the Garden of Gethsemane while the others waited outside the gate, the wall. Um, so there were three that were especially close to him. And then the, the 12... They had all started as disciples. In fact, some of them, Andrew and some of the others, had started as disciples of John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus, and you know, they, they were followers, disciples of John the Baptist. When John identifies, you know, points to Jesus as a, this is the one I've been talking about, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, some of John's disciples started following Jesus and therefore became Jesus' disciples. Andrew being one particularly that, that sort of started it. And then he went and found his brother Peter and said, Peter, come, we have found the Messiah. Um, so, yeah, they all started as disciples in one way, but Jesus selected the 12 to be especially trained. Now, we think of the 12 apostles. There, obviously, there were 13 because Judas was replaced uh, after, you know, after his betrayal and death. They felt there, there needed to be 12. There's an importance to 12 and that there were 12 tribes of Israel. You know, 12 is a very important number in Scripture. But you also get... By special appointment, Paul was an apostle. You know, the rules to becoming an apostle is, one, you had to have been taught by Jesus and been with him. Second, you had to have experienced the resurrected Christ. Paul experienced the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus, you know, um, knocked him down. We always say knocked him off his horse. Well, he wouldn't have been riding a horse because a horse was only an army uh, transport. He, and it doesn't say he was on a mule, which would have been the other option. It just says he was knocked to, knocked to the ground. Um, and, he, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
Later on, Paul talks about the fact that I will not boast of my own accomplishments, but I will boast of a man who was taken up into the third heaven and was taught things. So Paul's testimony, and he's, he's being modest there, not referring to himself, but clearly he's talking about himself in the context, um, that Paul was miraculously taught by Jesus himself. You know, was, was uh, either in a vision or you know, bodily, was taken up into the third heaven. When we talk about the third heavens, what that means is, in the old sort of cosmology, the first heaven is the, the, is the sky that we see, you know, where the clouds are, all right, and the, and the birds and all that. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is deep, is like at night when you can see the stars. That's the second level of heaven. The third level of heaven is where God is, which is not something you can see, but it's, you know, so that was their sort of cosmological understanding. So the third heaven means to be taken in, or the third, yeah, the third heaven is to taken into the place where God is and to be taught. And Paul says that's what happened to him. So he has to defend quite often in his writings that he does qualify to be an apostle by special appointment, not in the way the rest of them were. But then we have other people that are referred to as apostle in a couple of places as well. It appears that Junius, a woman, and her husband, it says they were held um, in highest regard among the apostles. And that either means they were considered apostles or that the apostles held them in highest regard. It can be translated either way. Um, there's one place where Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the head of Jerusalem Council, is referred to as an apostle. So, while the, li the list is limited, there are others that were referred to as having an apostolic office in Scripture, in the New Testament. But not often. It's usually the, the 12, the 13 if you add, add uh, Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, 14 if you count Paul. Alright? Make sense? So, the four Gospels. I've said this before. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I've described how they present Jesus, are called the three synoptic gospels. That basically means same seeing. Sin means same. Optic, you know, means eye. The same seeing. They take the same approach, basically, in that they're telling from slightly different perspectives and with slightly different orientations, they're telling the historical story of Jesus, what happened when he was on earth. I say different perspectives because, as I said, Matthew is much more concerned about presenting him from a Jewish perspective, uh, Luke very much from a Gentile perspective, and Mark somewhere between. And so you get the different images. And the way I, I describe that, I think the first time we ever went through this, is if we had something happening right in the middle of the sanctuary, and we had four people standing in the four corners so that they had that, that angle on it, and there were things going on. Obviously, there, there could be some things going on on the other side of whoever you're watching, and you couldn't quite see it. But then there are times you can see things that the other people couldn't. So that's why we get four stories, and they, they're not always exactly the same, because even though they were witnessing the same events, they were looking at it from a different angle, a different perspective. And yet they're not inconsistent, it's just there are some things in some of, in some of the Gospels that are not in others. Then John represents Jesus as the Son of God, and it is much more theological. It has the long passages. If you come to our uh, Bible study on John on Friday mornings, we, you'll notice, or if you read it, you'll notice that John will be sounding just like the, the, the three synoptic gospels in terms of these telling events. And then all of a sudden, he'll get into an explanation of what it means, either in the words of Jesus or just, just in the words of John. And so he'll give us an explanation. John is where we have these long sermons by Jesus, which give the theological explanation for things. Um, and, and the high priestly prayer in John 17 and things like that. So John is much more concerned about explaining not just, just what was happening, but what it meant and why it was happening. Whereas the, the first three don't get into that so much. Um, and... I've said before, I believe that what happened was Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written very early, probably in the 50s, so within 20 years after Jesus' life, uh, within 30 years after Jesus' life, and then John was not written until probably the 90s, a lot later, and in all likelihood, this, my own perception is probably the people, John was in Ephesus at that time, uh, the people who had the first three Gospels, they said, look, we understand what happened, but we don't always understand what it means. Can you help us understand what it means? And so John, much later, comes along and writes a very different kind of gospel. 
Not inconsistent with, but going into more of the meaning behind stuff. Okay? Questions? Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll actually look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're going to deal with the three synoptic Gospels today. And then next week, simply because we have to break this up somehow over the next weeks, we'll deal with the Gospel of John, being that it's quite different, and the Book of Acts next week. Okay, let's actually start looking at the books, the Gospels. And a good place to start is with Matthew. Uh, you've got probably better charts and that sort of thing in the book. For those of you who have the book, people have just been telling me how, how good they think the book is. It really is very good. What's that? It's at home. Okay. But there's a lot of information there. Again, the author of the book of Matthew is traditionally Matthew the Apostle. This is Matthew Levi, who had been a tax collector. And Jesus called away from his tax collector booth up near Capernaum in the uh, in Galilee. We believe it was written sometime 58 to 68 A.D. Um, some people have suggested uh, perhaps as early as 50 A.D. There are some, a few people who think that Matthew may have been the first gospel, but most people now have accepted that Mark was uh, probably the first gospel. And uh, I've heard people say, well, you know, if they were serious about this, why did they wait 30 years to write these books? Yeah. Well, very simply because they thought Jesus was coming back any day. <laughs> and so they occupied themselves with going out personally and testifying. You know, traveling the various of the apostles. You know, uh, Mark went to Egypt. Um, the, Thomas went to India. Various other places around the world in order to share the gospel. Well, after 25 years or so, and some of the apostles had already been martyred, they realized we're not going to live forever, and Jesus hasn't come back yet. We can't be sure he's going to come back before we die, and so we better write this stuff down so that it isn't lost or forgotten. But initially, they didn't think they needed to write it down. They thought that the focus should be on personally going out and testifying because they did not know Jesus was going to tarry so long as he did. Okay? Um, that very similar thing to why the uh, Jewish people ended up waiting so very long to write down the, the Jewish scholars, to write down the Talmud, the oral law, because as long as things were going well, they assumed they would continue to share it and teach it to young people and that they would memorize it and it would be passed on. When they finally realized they were in danger of losing it because so many were dying um, and under persecution and whatnot, they said, we've got to write this stuff down. So the oral law was written down. The same basic reason is out of concern that the message would be lost if the people who personally had experienced it are no longer there. Okay? Um, it's the most Jewish of the Gospels. It shows Jesus to be greater than Moses, the son of David, kingly Messiah who fulfills Jewish prophecy. So in Matthew, Jesus is very much presented from a Jewish perspective. As Messiah, as descendant of David, as greater than Moses, all those are Jewish reference points. And that he fulfills the Jewish prophecies. Um, this is the, in the book of Acts, we also have a number of times when this is true. The early sermons of Peter, all speak in terms of Jesus as the messianic fulfillment of the Old Testament expectation. The, the testimony of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, um, is entirely referring back to the Hebrew Bible and how to demonstrate that Jesus is the fulfillment of those expectations. Is that the reason why the book of Matthew is the first one after the Old Testament? Is it because of that link? Um, that reference back to the Old Testament? Yes. Um, I'm thinking now. Uh, because I seem, I remember a specific reference to that, that it was seen as the bridge between the old and the new. You know, the first three synoptics because, you know, John came forth because it's quite different. But it goes from Jewish to, uh, the Gospels go from more Jewish to more Gentile when you go Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, so Matthew is very much a bridge in that regard. Okay? Yes? There's 30 or 40 years after Jesus' death when we talked about that day, but they were even coming back. But the, these books are, the events within the books are so detailed that one would wonder if their memory would be that great. Would it be fair to assume, or do you know, were, were, these, uh, were the apostles telling these stories for all those 30 years? Is that how they were able to remember right. such detail? Well, that's part of it, is that the, you know they, they ended up writing, it's like somebody who teaches a class for how many years, and they set about writing a book, they've got all the material, you know, they know it. 
just have to put it down. It, that's part of it. And the other part of it is that we cannot evaluate their ability to remember based upon our lack of ability to remember. Uh, it used to be, I mean, I just mentioned that the, the, the Jewish scholars, they memorized the Talmud. The Talmud today is like 6,200 pages long. And they would memorize it. Uh, people would memorize long sections, if not the whole thing, in the Old Testament. The only equivalent we have of that today is in Islam. They still emphasize the memorizing of Scripture so much that that they have special special uh, titles for people who memorize all of the Quran. When I say title, it becomes part of their name. And off the top of my head, I'm forgetting what it is right now. But someone who has demonstrated they memorize all of the Quran, it's like you know I would be master of Scripture, Ross Arnold, and that would become my name. Um, like like my dog when he became a champion, Bob. You know. It was no longer, his, his actual name became champion, Fopaz in Majoran's last call, right? That's the case in Islam if you memorize all of the Quran. And they still do that today. But in, you know, Socrates, um, the first of the great Greek philosophers that we know, I mean, there are great Greek philosophers before that, but one of the big three, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, Socrates did not write. In fact, he didn't believe in writing. He, he would not let his students write. Why? Because he said, if you can write things down, you won't remember them. It's more important to remember than to write them down. But in reality, until these books were written, it wasn't written down. So they must have been yeah. used stories. Yeah, I mean, in those days, people would remember things. You know, that's the point, is they would, they would memorize all of that. And I mean, read the Gospels and read Paul. The long passages that they'll quote from the Old Testament. You know, uh, the... They were just, that's, they were steeped in this stuff, and they memorized it, and they learned it, and their memories were much better. I have people today who say, I just can't memorize things. I think you said that to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember saying that. Yeah, exactly. You remember that part. Uh, because I, I remember I said to people, uh, I strongly recommend you you memorize the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Blessed is the man that will, uh, that's, that's, that's the first song. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. You, we have lost the extraordinarily important art of remembering things. They were there. I mean, they, they still know how to remember things. So the fact that it wasn't written down would not have been considered a huge disadvantage to them. Okay? I don't, I don't think we've done yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Besides Jill. that, the Holy Spirit brought it to their there mind. That's true. And there you go. And the, it's inspired. Right. But, yeah, they, right. In fact, Paul even says that, you know, when you, or I'm sorry, Jesus said, when you are brought before the courts, don't worry about what you're going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Right. Right. right? right. So, so the purpose of Matthew is to um, prove to the Jews from the Jewish perspective that Jesus is the Messiah, the one in whom they should put their faith. You can think of an outline of Matthew, all starting with P's. It's almost a little too cute. I didn't create this. I just, uh, but the first four chapters, or into the fourth chapter, the presentation of Jesus as the king, then the proclamation of Jesus through his ministry, the power of Jesus as demonstrated through his miraculous events. <laughs> Bless you. The uh, progressive rejection of Jesus, first a few and then more and more. Then the preparation Jesus made of his disciples. After, a certain, after John the Baptist's death, more and more Jesus starts saying to his disciples, a time is coming when I'm going to be going up to Jerusalem and I will be arrested, tried, and put to death. All right? And he starts talking about his own death to prepare them for that. One of the first times he does that, Peter says, you know, no, we're not going to let that happen. Um, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Pretty strong words because he was trying to prepare them for that and then the presentation of Jesus in Jerusalem and the rejection you know when he comes in um, Palm, what we know as Palm Sunday and they, they recognize him as the Messiah the son of David he's rejected and then the proof of Jesus as the king through his resurrection okay key verses I'll, I'll give you two passages here in Matthew which I think it's sort of give you an orientation to what Matthew's about. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, Son of Man is a very Jewish expression. It comes from the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. 
in which it describes, Daniel says, I saw one coming as the Son of Man, and he describes the Son of Man as being given all authority and power and dominion. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom which will have no end. So Son of Man to the Jews meant something very, very powerful and important. It does not mean, it's not a euphemism for just another guy, which is what most people think it means. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You notice all Jewish references. Um, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ would have been Messiah in Hebrew. The Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He was giving great power. Now, some people, the Catholic Church obviously takes this as a representation of the fact that Peter, who, whom they claim is the first bishop of Rome, the first pope, that the power is being given to him. Other scholars, partly because of the language and partly because of other things Jesus said, believe that he may have been saying, and I tell you that you are Peter, and then refers to all of the apostles and saying, and on this rock, you know, of all of the apostles, or maybe he's referring to the statement of faith that Peter has just made. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and it's on that that the church will be built. It could be any of those. I mean, we don't, we don't have a problem with any of them. But uh, people who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, he said he was the Son of Man, well, first, they don't know what Son of Man means. Again, read Daniel 7. Secondly, he does make those claims about himself. You know, before Abraham was, I am. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Um, and then the number of times like this, or like Thomas calling him my Lord and my God, he never corrects people who call him God. He never says anything other than positives about that. When he, the chief priest during his trial before the Sanhedrin says, um, are you the Son of God? Jesus says, it is as you say. Um, some people, some translations have said, well, you said it, which people have dismissed as seeing like, well, that's your idea, not mine. That's not what he was saying. And the reason we know that's not what he was saying is a better translation is, it is as you said, because what does the high priest do immediately when, when Jesus says that? Remember? He tears his robes and declares blasphemy. And they said, we don't need any more testimony. That's all that's required. Everybody there clearly understood that Jesus was claiming to be divine. Because otherwise they would not have declared it blasphemy. Okay? And here, again, people are... Um, Simon is declaring him to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Second passage in Matthew 28. This is at the other end of the perspective. This is after his resurrection. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This was immediately before his ascension into heaven. Okay? After his resurrection, before his ascension. And after his resurrection, he spent 40 days with the the apostles and disciples teaching them, making sure they really got it in preparation for his departure and then the coming of the Holy Spirit in the, in the second chapter of Acts. This, this passage at the end of Matthew is repeated almost, um, well, there's a reference at the end of Luke to this, and, there's, and then it's also repeated at the beginning of Acts, because Luke wrote the first book, and then to bridge into the second book, he almost repeats himself about this declaration, and then the second chapter of Acts is where the Holy Spirit is given. Okay. Questions about that? Yes. Is the quote from uh, Peter in Matthew 16 where he says, You're the Messiah, the Son of God. And then we see Peter going off the deep end at other times. But well, just once, because not that I know of. I oh, mean, okay. and, and Paul says, Peter started, you know, started think, agreeing with the Judaizers, or Ebionites as they're called historically meaning you had to be circumcised. He started hanging out with the circumcision party, and I had to smack him upside of the head and straighten him out. But he, you know, he, 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 he figured it out. Is, is that just seeing that dichotomy in him, is that so that we have 
so that we we know we're not nuts that you know because we're humans we can mess things up. Right, I think so. I mean, they, they were human. Uh, now Peter never renounced. Uh, he, Peter went off the deep end with you know when he denied Jesus. You know if that's what you're yeah, referring. Yes. yes. But I'm thinking after you know after the resurrection when when Jesus oh, okay. you know brings him back in. So, but the idea that we can be fearful and that we can lose faith and we can still be brought back uh, as Peter did, I think, yeah, there, that's very much a, an affirmation to us that we're not going to get it right all the time, but yep. there is still grace. So, yeah, I, I was thinking in terms of post, post-resurrection post there, but yeah, before Jesus is even crucified, Jesus, yeah. uh, he's betrayed by Peter. So. We just have a lot of knuckleheadedness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's a theological term, but... <laughs> very advanced, very advanced. Okay, so that's the book of Matthew. Very quick overview. There is more detail in the books that you all have. Um, and then you're also reading the Gospels as we go along, right? You really should take this as an opportunity to, you know, to read the books that we're talking about. Um, a week is plenty of time to be reading, you know, there's, there's really not that much in there. I think I mentioned to you before that when, when I've had passages of scripture, or I'm sorry, passages from books when we were using multiple books, like two books in this course, people said, man, that's too much to read. I can't read that much. I had a, a course uh, reading some modern Protestant theology where we had to read a book a week and reflect on it before the next class. And some of them were 600 pages long. And this was GFW Hegel or Kant you know, critique of pure reason, or the philosophy of history, or this stuff was, was monsters, and even the short ones, you know, Kierkegaard's little book, Sickness Unto Death, I've said it before, and I will maintain this till I die, if anybody can read the first page of Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death, which is not a very big book, but just read one page and tell me they understand what he's talking about, I'll call him a liar or give him a thousand dollars, because it's just... You know, and so this reading is easy, and, and scripture reading is easy. So, okay. And after all, the scripture is what this is about. That's, that's the focal point of this. Let's talk about the second of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. Traditionally, the writer is John. I say traditionally because there are people who argue against this. I believe that these are accurate, okay, that it is John Mark. John Mark was an associate, first of Paul's and then of Peter. The first missionary journey... Um, Paul and Barnabas and Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, left Antioch by boat, went to um, Cyprus, spent time on Cyprus, and on Cyprus, Paul started preaching and performing miracles. And previously, Barnabas had been seen as being the more important one in terms of the church. Uh, he was better known, he'd been around longer. It was Barnabas that sort of introduced Paul and vouched for him after he became a Christian. But Barnabas was seen as being the leader. Well, on Cyprus, Paul begins to take the lead in terms of preaching and in terms of miraculous perform, uh, performing miracles. So that by the time they leave Cyprus and get to Atanalia, which is the city of Atalia in uh, Turkey today, but it was Atanalia in Asia Minor, they start referring to Paul first. And clearly Paul takes the leadership. Some scholars believe that that may have been why John Mark <coughs> left them. Because when they landed in Asia Minor, John Mark leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. Paul was really angry at him about that. But he, he said he deserted us. Um, but they believe it may have been because John Mark wasn't happy that his cousin Barnabas was being put in the second position and Paul was being elevated to the front. Uh, so John Mark left. The second missionary journey, Barnabas proposed that John Mark go with him on the second journey. And Paul absolutely refused. said, no, you know, he deserted us once. We're not going to do this again. Barnabas and John Mark go off themselves by boat to Cyprus and then other missionary efforts. Mm -hmm. And the second missionary journey, Paul takes Silas and they go north overland into the churches of Galatia. But this is that John Mark. And then later on, after, and later on they, they uh, reconcile because Paul speaks of John Mark later in his Gospels and says, you know, um, bring him to see me. So it all turned out fine. But Later, after the, the things with Paul, he became the assistant secretary, um, disciple, if you will, of Peter. So that's why we believe that the Gospel of 
Mark is pretty much the Gospel according to Peter, written around the same times, we believe, as the likely dates of uh, the writing of Matthew. Probably a little earlier, because we think it's the first one. Uh, so we may think that, that Mark was written 57, 58 in there, and then Matthew was 58, 59, 60 in there. But we're not exactly sure. I'll tell you why I say that later. Uh, we believe it's the first gospel written, likely the source document for the other synoptic gospels, and is recording Peter's memories of Jesus, is to show Jesus as God's son and the suffering servant. So it's appealing both to Jews and Gentiles. Mark does something Matthew doesn't do at all, and that is he explains some of the Jewish events and meaning, you know, what's going on when that's happening. An outline might be the presentation of Jesus as servant in the first two chapters, then the opposition to Jesus, instruction from Jesus, the rejection of Jesus, and the resurrection. Again, this is the shortest of the Gospels. I often recommend either this or John, depending upon where I think somebody is, if they want to you know, in, in referring them to read scripture, because Mark is shortest and easiest, the, the language is more straightforward, John is, is theologically more detailed, it's beautiful, but the language is more complicated, uh, I mean, in terms of the theological content of it. In terms of key verses for the book of, of Mark, we've got two, first from Mark 10, which says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Remember, the servant, Jesus as the servant, is, is a major thing. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And then, backing up a little to Mark 8, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The idea of being willing to sacrifice, to give yourself. And to say to take up your cross daily, um, we... There's no way for us to conceive of how that would have sounded to a Jewish ear. Because the cross was not just a method of execution, it was, it, it embodied the ungodly and, and everything that was negative in the world. Because there was a curse on anyone hanged on a tree, so there, was, there were theological implications to it. It was the most horrendous way anybody's ever come up with to die, or to kill someone, to execute someone. And it was the tool the Romans used to terrorize. So when Jesus says, take up your cross daily, they, they, their jaws must have fallen open saying, what? what? You know, um, it would have been astonishing. And yet, this is an example again that Jesus is talking about his intention to be a servant of all, to give himself up for the sake of others. And that all of his followers should be willing to do that too. The servant of Okay? Questions? All right, let's look at the third of the Synoptic Gospels, which is the book of Luke, of course. Traditionally, Luke, the companion of Paul, the only Gentile writer of any books in the, the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. Uh, he wrote Luke and Acts, we believe written slightly later still, probably the third of the Synoptic Gospels written. Um, a Gentile, Luke wrote this Gospel as the most universal, showing Jesus as the compassionate Savior of the whole world. Mark was a little bit of both. Luke is just wide open. Jesus is for everybody. Okay. Purpose is to show Jesus as the good news who cares for the poor and broken and desires salvation for all. Luke has a special emphasis on compassion. It's one of the major themes in Luke. Um, a simple outline might be the introduction of Jesus as the Son of Man, the ministry of the Son of Man, the rejection of the Son of Man, and then crucifixion and resurrection. A couple of key verses from Luke 1 first. This is the explanation for how Luke came to write this book. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those uh, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent, excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. 
So he investigated, again during the two-year period Paul was in prison in Caesarea before he was taken to Rome. Luke is going around meeting everybody. And I've mentioned before that there are examples like what he says in Luke is where it says that Mary heard all these things and stored them up in her heart. Well, how do we know that? Because Luke talked to her and asked her what was going on with her when, when all of this was occurring. You know, what was it like to be the mother of Jesus and to experience his crucifixion, etc.? So, and Theophilus, um, in those days it was not uncommon for someone to have kind of a patron, somebody who supported you. And so this is being written for him and in honor of him, apparently. Some people have said Theophilus may simply be a metaphorical reference because Theophilus means the, the, the lover of wisdom or the lover of philosophy, okay? Um, and so, we don't know. It's more likely that it was actually a person, Theophilus. And then Luke 19, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Um, this is part of our gospel reading for tomorrow. Um, it's the story of Zacchaeus. But the idea that he came to save the children of Abraham but then we discover that we're all children of Abraham. As Paul says, we are grafted onto the vine. Father Abraham is the father of the Jews, of the Christians, and of Islam, according to the beliefs of Islam. Okay. Questions? Okay, I want to talk to you now about something called the synoptic problem. It's not so much a problem as just a um, question, a, a curiosity, whatever. The synoptic problem... Uh, I'm going to lay this out a couple of different ways, so if this first section is confusing to you, don't let it be. 76% of Mark is found in both Matthew and or Luke. And when I say found in, it's verbatim. You know, the same words. 3% of Mark is found only in Luke. 18% of Mark is found only in Matthew. 58% of Matthew is found in both Mark and Luke, and 41% of Luke is found in both Matthew and Mark. <laughs> Train leaves the station, you know, going 90 miles a day. It's a little bit confusing. Another way to look at it. Of the 661 verses in Mark, Matthew has 601 of those verses, and Luke has 308 of those verses. And when I say they have them, they have them verbatim. They clearly are copied. From, from one to the other, somewhere. Only 31 verses in Mark are not found in either Matthew or Luke. <coughs> All right? So how does that come to be? This is the synoptic problem. The question is, what order were they written in? Who used whom as a source? You know, which... Um, this is a chart of the relationship, which is even more confusing than that first thing, I think. 76% um, of Mark is found in Luke and Matthew. So 41% of Luke is the same, 45% of Matthew is the same. That's called the triple tradition in the middle, that all three of them have that same material. Then you've got some material that is in Mark and Luke, and some material that's in Mark and Matthew. You also have some, some material, 23% of Luke and 25% of Matthew, is, is in, are shared. That's the double tradition between uh, Matthew and Luke. And then there's 35% of Luke is unique and 20% of Matthew is unique, right? So, somebody was using somebody else's document when they prepared theirs. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You see how that is? It is, yeah, okay. you could claim that it was a miraculous act of the Holy Spirit, but I don't think we have to. There's no reason why they shouldn't. You know, if, if I were Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and I sat down to write, to write this story, and I knew there was already one of my friends, fellows, fellow Christians who had already written this, first thing I'm going to do is probably go and get their book and look at it. And if there are parts of it, I go, that's perfect. I don't need to even change that. I'm just going to include it and then add the stuff that's not included that I need to put in, right? Um, so there are three ideas about how this all worked. St. Augustine, back in the 400s AD, he proposed what's called the Augustinian Hypothesis, that Matthew came first, and there are a few scholars who still maintain that Matthew might have been the first one. And then Matthew's material was used by both Mark and Luke, because Mark was second, and then Luke used Matthew and Mark. 
and then added some of his own stuff based upon his interviews, right? The second theory, known as the Griesbach theory, after the person that proposed it, the theologian, is that Matthew was first, Luke was second, and Mark was third. And they, they influenced each other in that direction. The most common hypothesis today, which is known as the Farrar thesis, because he's the first one who presented it, is that Mark came first, and that he influenced both Matthew and Luke. All right? Now, um, the simplicity of Mark, the fact that it's the shortest, um, it is more universal. It's almost as though Mark was there and it was fairly general. And Matthew took that and, and wanted to focus on the Jewish people so that the message was for the Jews. Luke was especially interested, although it's universal, the most universal, he especially wanted to make sure we included the Gentiles more strongly. Um, but the fact that there is, that Mark, almost all of Mark is represented in Matthew and Luke, but there are other materials that are not in Mark that are the same in Mark and, in uh, Matthew and Luke, leads to what's called the two-document four-source theory. I took this from the book. Okay. Um, which means Mark came first. The two arrows is he influenced both Matthew and Luke. The M over on this side is Matthew had his own stuff that he added. And on the other side, Luke had his own stuff that was added. But there's a fairly significant chunk of material that's not in, in Mark, but it is in Matthew and Luke. And so the suggestion is there was some other source that both Matthew and Luke looked at in order to have the material for their, their book. That is called Q. That's the, that is the um, synoptic or the, the two-document answer to the synoptic problem. It's called Q because it was a German, you know, German theologians did a lot of this kind of stuff. Q uh, is for Kelle, which is German for source. So the generally accepted view now, not everyone agrees with it, is that Mark was the first of the Synoptic Gospels written. He influenced Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke added their own stuff from their own experiences or what they learned from Paul or you know, others. But then there was some other source which explains how Matthew and Luke have some of the same material that didn't come from Mark. They didn't make it up themselves because it's verbatim. It didn't come from Mark, so it had to come from somewhere else if it's verbatim in both those books, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now again, it's valuable for us to know that there was, a, I believe, there was a lot of interaction. You know, the church was working together on this stuff back then. It makes perfect sense to me. It, it, it is a divinely inspired book written by humans. Um, and there's no problem with that. This is in no way a negative. As I say, the servants of God who were, to, who were called upon to write this down, if I had been one of them, the first thing I would have done is said, well, I know Mark has already written an account. Let me look at his first. And add that in. And if I was Luke, if Matthew was the next one written, I'd probably look at both of them. And so I'd end up with parts of their books in mind. It is still divinely inspired. Yes? I think you explained in one of your earlier classes, maybe last year, um, that, or maybe I read it somewhere else, that it was almost a, a compliment to plagiarize somebody. Right. It wasn't really considered any wrong with it. It was a recognition that if you use their stuff, that was a right. It, it, it was a way of um, affirming them, of affirming their story as being accurate. And so if anything, people say, well, you know, you've got all these different, the, the Gospels are all different. Well, they're not at all. In fact, they share a lot of the same material. And what they don't share is because they were, as I said, standing in different corners of the room when these things were happening, and so they got a slightly different perspective on them. But they're not inconsistent. And people say, well, there's a different order of events. Well, that's because, with the exception of Luke, these were all Hebrew writers. And in, in the Hebrew way of writing, they didn't write history with a sense that you had to do things in chronological order. First this happened, second this happened, third this happened. In fact, they, more often in Hebrew writing, they would cluster together the things they thought were relevant to each other, even if they didn't happen in that order. So if there's some parable that's told, you know, in the middle of the second year of Jesus' ministry, but it's relevant to something Jesus said in the first year of his ministry, or some event happened, it's very much a Jewish pattern that they would bring that, those two things together because they thought they complement one another, and they, they, 
They sort of uh, give, they affirm the same message. That was very common in those days. And it's not just in the Bible we find that sort of stuff. That was very common in the writings. And not in the Jews primarily, but even, even other ancient writers. Um, history, as we understand history, had only been invented 400 or so years before this. History in terms of an objective report of chronological events was invented by Herodotus. Thucydides came along a little later and did the same thing. But Herodotus, the Greek historian, writing about the Peloponnesian Wars, um, in, or rather the, the uh, Persian Wars, Peloponnesian Wars with Thucydides, that was the first time anybody ever tried to give an objective account and, and paid much attention to chronology. Before, history had always been telling it so that your guys look like the good guys, even if it wasn't you know, literally true. And so that was only 400 years before this that history, as, as we think of it, had been invented, and it had not greatly influenced the Hebrews yet. So we get a different perspective on that kind of stuff. All right? Um, We've gone back to that kind of historical writing today. Yeah, and we call it, and we call it journalism now. It's, when I studied journalism, we had, it was called yellow journalism, and yet that's the predominant now. Uh, you can, it doesn't matter whether what you're saying is true as long as it accomplishes the goal you want. Um, so, so this is how we understand the structure of the, the three synoptic Gospels. Questions about any of that? Questions about the different thematic parts of the Gospels, what, what they're trying to represent, how they fit together? Yes, Jim. I want to know what happened to the end of Mark. Well, the, the, the end of Mark is, there's a, why, why is there a section at the end of Mark which says some of, the most, some of the oldest of the documents don't have this? It's set aside. This is one of the things that allows us to say that, that, that we believe Scripture is very accurate. It's when there are more than one source that had something like that, but not the oldest sources, then it's set aside and it's identified in the modern translations as being different. What happened was that when the King James Bible, which is the one everyone knew for so long, when it was written 400 years ago, uh, or translated 400 years ago, they did not have the best sources. The very best sources that we have for the New Testament today came from primarily three big documents, or codexes. Codex is the ancient word for a book. You know, they used to use scrolls, and it's not, you couldn't go to the middle of a scroll very easily unless you were willing to do this for a long time, okay? Um, but, and so somebody came up with the idea, why don't we just cut the scroll in pieces lay them on top of each other, and then stitch them together, and that way you can flip to the middle if you want to. Those early books were called codexes. The, the three most important sources we have for Scripture now are the Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Vaticanus, and the Codex Alexandrinus. And they are named that because the Codex Sinaiticus was found at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert, which you should visit there sometime if you can. It's right at the foot of Mount Sinai. Um, the Codex Vaticanus was found in the bowels of the Vatican. You know, they've got so much stuff. The Vatican goes is really deep, you know, they, they, underneath, and they've got thousands of square feet of stuff. And they, they found that later. And then the Codex Alexandrinus, which they found in Alexandria. Neither of those three were available to the scholars who translated King James uh, Bible from the originals into English. So what happened was we ended up with things like the King James and some other versions that had the end of the book of Mark, which is kind of, it's kind of strange. You know, you'll take up serpents, they'll bite you and you'll not be harmed, you'll drink poison and not, you know, and not die, which has led to some kind of weird uh, sects. You know, the snake handlers, I'm from Tennessee. Well, the Church of God Anderson, you know, in Tennessee, etc. They used that, the end of, of Mark, as justification for that being a sign of their faith. Well, that had been part of, uh, of what was used to, to create the King James, but when they found older documents, they found that it wasn't in there. Now, what does it suggest if it wasn't in the older documents and it is in later documents? It got added. It got added. It wasn't something the original authors wrote. But you know what? If you just lop it off and don't have, don't acknowledge it at all, somebody's going to claim that you've you've messed around with scripture. But also, 
without that, Mark ends very strangely. Yeah, very abruptly. Yeah. Um, the book of Acts ends very abruptly, too. Yeah, but Mark, I can't remember very well, but uh, it, it ends with the women being scared to death or something, and that's it from, from the... Well, when we the three codexes that we have that are the most ancient, they're not original. They still were were yeah. copies, but they are the oldest, and so therefore, so there's two pieces of this. One is that gives us the justification for putting sort of big parentheses around the ending of Mark and saying this is not in the oldest. And if you look in your Bible, then it will say the following is not in the oldest uh, versions of, of Mark that are available to us. But it may be that if we had the original document, there may have been something that got lost along the way. There may have been a better ending. We don't know. But does anybody think that? I mean, like it, that it got broken off, torn off, ripped off. We don't. We don't know. Nobody speculates. Well, well I mean, people have said that. Have said just what I just said, and that is that may be why it ends so abruptly. Is there may have been something that got, as you say, torn off, lost, the end of a, you know, the back end of a codex. Uh, got torn apart and they lost part of it or part of a scroll or whatever. Um, we don't know that. There's no evidence for it. But like we said before when we were talking about the, in the Old Testament class, we were talking about the creation theories, you know, and there are six different ways of explaining how creation happened from purely evolutionary natural selection to, you know, um, young earth creationism. Well, a couple of those are, they say, well, what's the evidence for that? Well, in some of them, there's no evidence. They're just efforts to try to explain what we find in front of us. And, yeah, they're creative, but they're simply a way of saying, well, here's one possible explanation. Maybe this happened. Um, and as long as we don't take that as gospel, there's nothing wrong with, that, with thinking about stuff and coming up with ideas about it. The same, the same thing would be true with Mark. Why does it end so abruptly? We have that in front of us. Well... You know, it, perhaps there was some section of it that we didn't that didn't continue. Um, and again, that's no criticism of the scripture or anything else. And my sense is that if there was something else there that got torn off or lost or whatever, then it was something that God decided was not critical for us to know, because I don't believe He allows anything to get lost that we really need. Um, just just like we, the Book of Acts, as I mentioned, ends quite abruptly with Paul under house arrest in Rome and just stops. Well. The tradition, and there's some evidence for this tradition, is that Paul got let out of prison that time, traveled as far as Spain, maybe even as far as Britain, which was part of Rome, Roman Empire as well, so it's not unheard of that he would do that. But there's a very strong tradition that he went to Spain, and he says in Romans that he plans to go to Spain. And then he came back to the Mediterranean, he was rearrested and put in prison, and then we have the prison letters, you know, like 2 Timothy, which is the last of his letters. He talks about being in prison and being quite sure that he's not going to make it this time, even though he says, in my first imprisonment, you know. So there's that indication, but that's not in Scripture. It's, it's an, our best understanding, putting all the pieces together that we have. Other questions? Well, you're going to get an eight-minute vacation. <laughs>